time is the one resource you can never get back. Choosing where to spend it can be a bit tough as a gamer, especially when two massive new titles drop in the same month. By the end of this video, you'll have a good idea of what you want to play and invest your precious free time in. I needed some help with this one, so I summoned a co-pack and we butt chug these games. I'll be doing everything First Descendants. And I'll be tackling Once Human. One thing I should mention is I played on a PVE server only because the First Descendants is also only PVE. We did both agree on the one we thought was better, which we will get to at the end. Aside from the obvious, which is that Once Human is a PC only game, I think we should right off the bat mention the Once Human server wipe, which is gonna be a huge determining factor for a lot of people on whether or not they wanna invest time into this game. Once Human will implement server wipes once every season in both PvP and PvE servers, which is about every six weeks. This wipe is comparable to the ones in Rust. Everything in the server resets to include character levels, base builds, map exploration, and world scenarios. There are things you get to keep, like important currency, cosmetics, gear and house blueprints, and quest progress for main and side story missions. The seasons will bring new areas, scenarios, and survival elements to the table. The devs describe this as a quest for endurance and evolution, but not a wipe. Six weeks does seem a little bit short for a season, especially for a game like this, where you go in and you're building and it's a lot of different survival mechanics. It's not just outright PVP for everybody for the, who's experiencing this game. For the people I've talked to as well, they pretty much also agree that like six weeks feels a little too short, especially if you're only playing on a PVE server. It doesn't really make as much sense. But then if you're going to extend that time beyond six weeks, then the content cadence doesn't match the PVP servers. So how do you get around that? Besides just not having a wipe period on a PVE server. Let's move on to a quick intro to the lore and story in these games. 100 years ago on a planet called Ingress, dimensional gates opened, letting in big chungus baddies called the Volgus and the Colossi. Their main goal, to snap some humans in half. According to the lore, it only took about a day to wipe out the majority of humanity because we are useless meat bags compared to these monstrosities. But on the brink of extinction, some humans awakened the lost power of the ancestors, which gave them unique powers and allowed them to fight back in this giant random war. These powerful humans are of course called the Descendants. Fast forward 100 years and humanity is still at war with the Volgus, but now fighting their new leader. Mega Karen. The game starts you off in a sanctuary in the main hub, Albion, where you prepare to fight the war against all who seek to destroy humanity. At the beginning of Once Human, you awaken inside of a Rosetta lab with no memories. You are quickly greeted by a bird called V, who used to be just like you, a metahuman created by Rosetta. V offers to help you escape, but only after you help him secure something called a deviation. He explains that these deviations can be dangerous and unpredictable, so they need to be contained. They are unsure what they are, but what they do know is that they aren't bound by the physical laws of this world and that they come from something called Rift Space. Shortly after helping V, you are introduced to someone called Mitsuko, who also used to be a metahuman, but a very special one. She then goes on to tell you that about 20 years ago, Rosetta was experimenting and accidentally triggered an event they are calling Starfall, which led entities into a world they're calling Great Ones. This is where you join them as part of a group called the Mayflies. Your goal is to help secure these deviations and use them to help humanity through evolution. The Rosetta and the like big corporation that messed everything up in Once Human is very reminiscent of Resident Evil and the Umbrella Corporation. Very Umbrella Corporation. Even in like the way they're still continuing to do things because the Umbrella Corporation doesn't stop after they fucked everything up. Oh yeah, they're and evil as fuck. <laughs> and that's the same thing with Rosetta. They're still continuing their experiments. You would think somebody would be like, oh shit, maybe this is a bad idea. <laughs> Guys, we just ruined the entire planet. We should stop. Although I don't think many people actually give a shit about the lore and story in these types of games. I think it was important to at least have an ungabunga knowledge on it because often lore shapes the world's ambience, look, and environments. Speaking of environments, let's jump into these game settings. The First Descendants introduces several locations to explore. Aside from the main hub, which is very futuristic and tech inspired, there are a total of eight regions, each with several subregions and their own aesthetic. These aesthetics range from large grassy fields, mountains, and snowy regions, all with rocks, ruins, caves, future futuristic buildings, and supernatural surroundings. Every area you load into has a mini hub where NPCs hang out, but that's about all the life you'll find throughout the maps that isn't a monster trying to kill you. The maps are large, but very 
samey. The best way I can describe it is you'll pretty much know what the whole region looks like within 30 seconds of loading into it. Honestly, most areas feel bland and uninspired with the exception of your occasional awe-inspiring environment, but don't take that as a major complaint because in the big picture, this is a very beautiful game to look at. None of the regions are super detailed or dense, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. The nature of the game is very fast paced with its combat and movement, so the lack of detail isn't noticeable or missed. Boss arenas are pretty much all the same. This was a bit of a letdown. They consist of an empty, large space with a ton of squares, kind of reminiscent of being in the Anubis Assassin's Creed loading screens. There are variants of these large, empty spaces, but most of these differences are in the color schemes and the lighting. It's the classic, you can copy my homework, but change it a bit scenario with the boss arenas. This applies to all but the last boss fight, which I won't bother spoiling. And lastly, to address the elephant in the room, yes, this looks a lot like Destiny, but I didn't want to focus on that too much since it's worth giving it a fair description without making that comparison. Comparison. But yeah, wish brand destiny for sure. The environment is an area where one's human does a fairly decent job. There's a good enough variety in the layout and a lot of verticality, making the world feel pretty big. Aesthetically, it's mostly desert and grassy hills, at least for now, but it looks like there might be a snowy area that we can access down the road at some point. There's also these contaminated zones that have a more grim atmosphere while also stacking a debuff on you that reduces your max HP over time. The map is also broken down by levels up to 57, but things will unlock over time with each phase. The story does a good job at keeping you in the places you should be, but don't hesitate to go off and explore. Most enemies out in the world aren't all that tough, so you should be able to handle higher level areas without too much trouble if you're upgrading your gear. From what I've experienced, you can also enter most buildings you see, and they are actually full of stuff, not just some empty, boring space. Town layouts seem well done also, even though some of them are a bit on the small side, but sometimes I was thankful for that when I was searching for some of the more hidden objectives. There could be a bit more detail in certain parts of the world to really give off that post-apocalyptic feel more broken down cars or damaged buildings, but what they have gets the job done, I think. Graphics seem mostly good, but we have noticed the game has some pop in, especially when it comes to shadows. Lighting and particle effects are good. With the weather added in, it can make some places look pretty awesome. The map size is pretty large, being a 16 by 16 kilometer with lots of small towns and facilities and other objectives to check out, but some of the content is time gated, so don't expect to experience everything right away if you plan on blasting through this game. There are six phases in each season, each phase lasting one week, and offering more content to do, like more quests, silos, which are the game's version of dungeons, and harder difficulties for those silos, among other stuff. I would say what they have now, I think the theme of the game is really what carries it, rather than the environment variety. And as a contrast, this game, Once Human, is a slow-paced game versus in the first Descendant, where it's more fast-paced. Uh, you get your loot from killing enemies rather than going into buildings and finding things, and your character movement is a lot faster too. And I would say there is tech technically more variety as far as the setting goes, even though it is a little bit bland. Grassy rock or snowy rock or red rock, but it's <laughs> all rock, you know what I mean? The most detail they put into was the Albion, which is gonna be your hub. They put a lot of eye candy in that area for sure. They can get away with that, like, like you said, because you're moving around so fast, you're not worried about that. Your goal is start mission, finish mission, start next one, rinse, repeat. If you've ever played a survival game, then you should feel right at home playing Once Human. As soon as you finish the tutorial, you are dropped into a world with a mission objective that guides you through the initial setup of your base and sets you on the right path. After that, you will find yourself bouncing back and forth between doing story missions and doing crafting or base building stuff. Mission structure should be easy enough to follow as well and is nothing out of the ordinary. You're given a tracker on the left side of your screen and you follow a path given to you on the map, so you're never wondering where to go or what to do. Fairly straightforward. For the most part, doing the quests were enjoyable enough with some pretty cool moments that I don't want to spoil, but if you like the horror vibes, then there are a couple of parts you really might enjoy. So as you probably already know, this game is multiplayer, and that's kind of the whole point of it. Although you can do pretty much all the PvE stuff solo if you want, we ended up creating a hive. It's basically a small guild or a clan, and we set up all our bases in a little valley together. Being in a hive together lets us teleport to each other's bases, which is kind of nice, and allows for quick invites to other hive members for grouping. I did most of the content with friends, but I did notice some very bad lag sometimes when driving around with friends we would experience some rubber banding but also on the final boss in phase one making that fight not very fun even though the theme and mechanics were pretty cool the prime war was the worst by far though it's this big boss battle out in the open world for everyone on the server to come join in on and with like the 15 or so people that showed up the fight would constantly lag out to the point where it would take like five to ten seconds to even throw a grenade i believe they said they are working on this though so i'm expecting this to be sorted out soon enough server lag aside the other boss fights i've 
found to be pretty fun, even if they are a little simple on the mechanic side until you get into the harder difficulties when they start adding in more mechanics and extra modifiers. Since we're on the topic of boss fights, this is a good time to mention gunplay. So in Once Human, you have the option to shoot in third or first person, and I really appreciated having that as an option. Using third person when things get kind of close or you just don't really care about being too accurate, and first person when you need to beam somebody in the face a bunch of times. You can also use throwables like Molotovs, different types of grenades, throwing knives, or even summon drones that hover around you and shoot at things. All of these, including guns, can be buffed significantly based on the mods you equip to your guns and armor, like adding extra elemental damage, buffing your melee, healing you when you kill a burning target, buffing your crits, among other things. There are also armor set bonuses along with unique effects on some pieces of gear to give you even more build options. This adds an extra layer of depth to your character and lets build crafters like myself have a little bit of fun. And what's the point of mods if you don't have gear to put it in? So that leads us into the crafting. Because you can't repair gear you find out in the world, the only real option is to make your own. And the process is easy. Go around the world being a little loot goblin, grabbing everything you find, mine different ores, and just play through the game's content. Bring all the spoils back to base, use the right crafting bench, and voila. For higher level stuff, you'll need to spec into upgrading your benches, but you get so many points to spend in the mimetics tree that you shouldn't find yourself making tough choices. The entire crafting system is very well done without being overly complicated. Getting your hands on each material is self-explanatory, and each item tells you how to get it, so you're never left wondering. There is base building as well, and this is where I think the game needs a little bit of work. You can build a half-decent base with pretty much everything you would need, but the way stuff snaps together with building the roof or stairs seems kind of wonky right now. There's enough furniture and other things to fill up the space, and all the right building pieces are there. They just need to improve the snapping a little bit. You can also build a bunch of base defenses that might come in handy on a PvP server for defending against other players, but also when starting the purification defense event. This spawns waves of enemies to attack your base, but gives you a very valuable resource as a reward. You can use this as an opportunity to live out your tower defense dreams. I would say you have similar options to something like rust, so different types of turrets, pressure plates, and sensors so you can set up the automated dream base. Something I found refreshing is that the game doesn't seem to be overly grindy and mostly respects your time. It's pretty generous when it comes to gathering all the materials you need so you can spend your time doing what you want instead of just mindlessly grinding forever. The first descendant starts you off by having you choose your first descendant. You can choose from three, but there's a total of 14 characters as of now available to unlock, each with their own set of active and passive abilities in DPS, tank, and support roles. I haven't played all the characters, but from what I can tell, each has a build that can bring something different to the table, such as AoE damage, boss melters, and everything in between. I'm only going to scratch the surface when explaining this game due to how insanely complicated it gets, but the cool thing is that the game does cater to both casual and try-hard sweating no life neck beard min maxing players. Let's start at the beginning. No matter what character you choose, the game really holds your hand for the first hour or so of gameplay. During this period, you flow between objective markers. Every mission is super rewarding. You get levels quickly, you see a massive increase in stats, and you even unlock your second character, Bunny. This is done, in my opinion, to act as the hook, so to speak. It gives you a good idea of how the gameplay loop works and creates an addictive feeling for unlocking items, materials, and descendants. This lasts until just after the major boss and then the grind wall hits, and it hits hard. Shooting feels solid and responsive. There's a good variety of weapons and ammo types for you to choose from, and each feels unique and useful in different situations. The fast-paced movement combined with each character's unique abilities make for fun hours of mindless violence against waves of enemies. Let me take a moment to explain the gameplay loop. Simply put, you go out into a region that you're currently leveling through, you do your missions scattered throughout this region, you upgrade until you're strong enough to fight the big baddie daddy, rinse and repeat until all the big baddie daddies are dead. The missions consist of a variety of basic mission types, examples including point control, escort missions, clearing an area, fighting waves, completing dungeons, fighting mini bosses, and some other basic mission outlines. Nothing that breaks the mold in my opinion. You can do every mission solo or with a party of up to four people, and since you're always playing online, you may run into your occasional rank random that joins you in world objectives. Dungeons and Colossi are separate scenarios, so you won't be running into anyone in those unless you choose to do so. Multiplayer works well in most cases until the server decides to throw a fit. Then it's lag and rubber banding galore. Another major component of the game is the character builds. Each build is like a puzzle. Each piece of the puzzle can be modified and enhanced. Boss fights are actually pretty fun in the game. The only major complaint I would have is the lack of enemy variety can make fighting most mini bosses a bit of a drag. The Colossi, on the other hand, are tough, fun fights that are unique and have multiple boss mechanics each. These are definitely the highlight of the game and will be your main source for obtaining better loot. Baseline, the game is super easy to play, understand, and enjoy. But if you're looking to main the game, you're going to need to understand more complicated
complicated mechanics and spend a lot of time or money on it. This is where the casual players are likely to fall off. Get your knee pads on because this next part is not intended to help you understand the game, but rather showcase how absolutely bonkers ridiculous this shit gets. After you beat all the Colossi, you unlock hard mode, which you play through to get better items. The whole point of the game here shifts from beating the Colossi and unlocking characters to purely making your character as strong as possible. You do this a couple of different ways. The first is straightforward, leveling your character to max level 40. There's an added layer to leveling, which is profile specific, and that's your mastery level, which affects things like inventory capacity. But wait, there's more. Gear can be optimized by being paired into sets, and if you're lucky, can get even stronger if it's compatible with your character's skills. You can also level your weapon proficiency, which caps out at 40, sort of. Once you fully level a weapon, you can craft an item that prestiges it, which will set the weapon back to level one and optimize the weapon's mod slots one at a time. So you'll want to do this several times. And no, it's not a quick process. Mods, weapons, and attachments can all have unique stat boosts depending on their rarity. On top of that, the mods and loot can be mixed and matched into slots in both your character and your weapon. Lastly, crafting duplicates of legendary, ultimate, mega dick, whatever the highest rarity for weapons is, makes them stronger for some reason. And you can reroll unique weapons to change their stats. If all of this hasn't already smoothed out your brain, crafting and looting gets even worse. I mentioned defeating Colossi as a good way to get better loot, but you can't actually pick any of that loot up unless you have a prerequisite loot item that allows you to open it after beating the boss. Think of it like this. The boss is guarding a chest filled with loot, one of which could be the item that you need. Even if you kill the boss, you can't open the chest without having a specific piece of loot that acts as the key. This means that if you're looking for a specific item, you have a small RNG chance at getting the item to drop that allows you to open the box after beating the boss that has an even smaller chance of dropping the item that you actually need. You can see just from this example how grindy this game can get. Farming for items, having to repeat escort missions made me consider committing war crimes in Minecraft. Although the grind in the first Descendants is a little bit of a downside or major downside, I guess, in my opinion, it still might be a better option for people to play in the long term because of the fact that once human doesn't have that longevity because of its server wipes. If you're looking for a long-term thing for a free-to-play game, that's probably where it's going to be at. Unless you're really competitive into PvP stuff. Yeah, since PvP is missing in First Ascendant. That was a big turnoff for me because I love PvP. Like when I played Destiny 2, that's basically what I spent most of my time doing. And just the sheer amount of like things that you can do and unlock in the future. Say you have your character, you have your main, you get it to the point where it's strong as shit, really can't do anything more to it to make it stronger. You've min-maxed it to the brim. Well, now you have 14 other characters to <laughs> do the same thing with. So as far as like long-term gameplay goes, I think this is definitely something that people are going to be addicted to for what could be their the rest of their lives. Assuming they continue development and stuff, but from what I've seen, people really seem to like that game. First Ascendance is, has been at the top of the Steam charts for since it released about a month ago at this point. The power of free-to-play games. As far as gameplay for Once Human goes. The gameplay is, it's good, it's solid. Minus the server lag issues, which hopefully they address soon. I think it's just good it's fun yeah really and it's it. simple i have the toughest time whenever crafting begins to get into the multiple benches into the multiple nightingale flashbacks <laughs> there's like 20 different benches in nightingale think they simplify this there's like two or three benches and you're good yeah that's it there's like no crazy learning curve you yeah. just get in you do Something else I really enjoyed with Once Human is that sort of like Lovecraftian horror vibes that you get in yes. some areas. When you're in those moments, it's just like you start looking around like, wait a minute, is this a scary game? <laughs> What's yeah. going on? When did I sign up for a horror game? What is going on? This is yeah. really cool. Having established an idea of the grind factor in the first Descendants, I think it's a good time to move on to the topic of monetization. It's obvious they made this thick grind wall specifically to incentivize people to pay for progress. For example, you can outright buy Descendants. The cool ones, of course, harder to unlock by playing through the game, cost more money. There are packs in the game, including the Descendants and cosmetics, ranging from $20 to upwards to $100. You can pay to skip wait times in the crafting menus, which can take hours or even days. The ultimate enemy to impatient lads like myself. There's also a premium enhancement packages that can include boosters for experience gain, weapon proficiency, and a ton of loot, currency, etc. 
This makes a significant difference in your gameplay experience. With Once Human being a free-to-play game, you can fully expect it to have some form of monetization. You have the standard battle pass that's basically in everything now, as well as cosmetics. You could buy skins for all your weapons and armor, along with stuff like building skins. Want your house to look like it's made of glass? You can do that, but expect the shell out around 50 bucks for it. Being that this is a free-to-play game, I don't really care that the cosmetics are a little pricey as long as there is zero pay-to-win aspects in the game. From what I can tell, they seem to have not gone the pay-to-win route, and that alone is a pretty big deal when so many other games just don't care and will gladly take your money to give you a leg up. So I've always had this unpopular opinion where I would actually hate free-to-play games. I'd rather pay once for a full-blown experience where I don't have to be worrying about pay grinds, about pay to progress crap, which to pay me is the same thing. Right, the pay for convenience, like I have encountered so many people in the game sphere that actually defend this to their core, which I will never understand. When you have a PVP title and you can unlock something, people just think that because you can unlock it by playing the game, it's totally fine to make it extremely difficult to unlock it and then have it be available for paying for it and then it's you know i agree completely <laughs> like people will try to say things like it's pay for convenience as if it's something different it's the same thing it's pay, it's to, pay win. to win like yeah sure just because you can unlock it by playing the game doesn't mean that it's not pay to win yeah. if i can just give you 20 bucks and have the thing <laughs> what if i'm playing with some buddies and we're all trying to do stuff together we're all playing as a group and none of them want to swipe their credit card but i don't give a shit i'll swipe my credit card and now i'm so far ahead of them that they can't keep up with me anymore then that's just a pve yeah imagine if this game had pvp right i wouldn't touch us with a 10-foot pole we're talking about first ascendance Yes, first yeah. sentence. Once Human does not have... There's no pay to win. Any, yeah, monetization in Once Human's done fairly well. Yes. There was one issue that they are addressing with cosmetics not transferring from character to character, which they, I believe they say they are going to change. There's no pay to win. You're just buying cosmetics. And it's really sad to see the first descendants fall into that hole of just having like a ton of pay for convenience stuff, which kind of restricts it from having any PVP unless they just make like a whole separate thing and add completely different mechanics that have no pay to win thing. That's the only way that I can see them actually having successful PVP in that game because of how polluted it is with all this pay to win crap. Yes, and even the free models, if you wanted to get everything, like unless you wanted to spend a ridiculous amount of time grinding for it, you're gonna have to spend so much more money, so much more money. What were you saying? One of the character packs was like a hundred bucks? Yeah, with cosmetics included, but yes. But still, like, I mean, I bought Elden Ring for 60 bucks. <laughs> that's a that's game of the year. Literally, it was a fantastic game. So I just I can't see justifying that. So after our deep dive, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised when we say that we both enjoyed Once Human a lot more. <laughs> well, we think both games are pretty decent options for us personally. Once Human sort of hit that sweet spot that just captured us more. The first sentence just kind of starts feeling like an endless loop of grind at some some point and on top of that i think atmosphere the vibe the lore and just everything about one's human is a little bit more our style we have very similar interests and so a lot of personal bias is injected into our decision but anyway thank you so much for watching this video we really had a ton of fun making it it was fun having copac here irl with me it's a very unique experience that we get to go through today but if you guys want to see more in the future don't forget to like comment and subscribe it helps us out a ton bye